good morning you guys I'm about to milk I've got my equipment you can't see it I've got my equipment and um, today's the first day back to reality after visiting Polyface. I honestly don't want to be here I want to go back take me back offer me a job I will do anything for no pay if you just let me stay <laughs> but uh, in reality I'm coming back to this I don't know if you can tell it or not but the Sun is up here somewhere um, can't tell it looks like the apocalypse the wildfire wildfire smoke is back I can't even begin to think how bad it is for you because I will spiral down a rabbit hole uh, nevertheless I'm gonna continue on with my daily life and chores and I'm gonna go milk and then after that we are gonna get our second round of summer things planted um, excuse me this is my plant why are you here my lady One takeaway that I want to be more diligent about here on our farm is we do rotate the cows every <laughs> Tixie. We do rotate our cows every um, probably three to four days, um, but we're just not. We don't have a whole lot of pasture. I mean, we do, but it's in a hay field, and so in the uh next year i think i want to expand the pasture um so that we can rotate them better so one thing that he does is rotating every day which most people know and i want to move the cows every day uh because here's a little tidbit that i hadn't thought about i knew that we're rotating for lots of reasons but one of them being parasite load. So if your animals are constantly, any kind of animal, chicken, pig, sheep, cow, if they're constantly in the same areas um, without rest, paras <clears throat> the parasite load is going to be much higher. Uh, what I didn't know about the parasites is that you need to rest it for minimum 21 days for that parasite cycle to die. So if they're on a patch for a day, they can't come back to that patch for at least 21 days. And if not a little bit more so that your pasture grass can, um, can recover the way that it's supposed to. But a way to avoid using medications and vaccinations and uh, everything that the traditional conventional uh, farmers use is by rotating their pastures is a main one because you don't want them eating where they have pooped. I'm gonna hit her with some homemade fly spray. This is just mostly apple cider vinegar, a squirt of Dawn dish soap, and 20 drops each of some essential oils. Cedar wood, citronella, basil, and one other one. I have a video about making this fly spray um, back last summer, if you are that interested. I 
just put that on you. Quit licking it off. Yeah, it's yucky. Quit it. I'm done milking now, and I remembered what I was going to say about the parasite. So back to my parasite spiel. So the reason why you want to let your pasture rest is the life cycle of the parasite usually dies within 21 days of no host. So if you remove the host via the cow, the chicken, the sheep, whatever it is, um, the parasites don't have anything to live in, and then that, that cycle dies. So you're lessening your parasite load each time you do this. Another thing is why you want to let your want to let your pastures rest is so I didn't know this pa parasites live within you know three inches or less of the surface of the soil so let's say your grass is this tall or your pasture is this tall and the cows eat it down to here your parasites are living in that layer usually so if you come back again once your pasture is only grown back halfway and you let your animals graze it they're going to graze it down um, to where the layer of the parasites are so if there's any left in the soil there they're going to be re-eating it so to stop that cycle you let your grass fully grow back for one it's good for your pasture um, it's giving the plant energy because let's say your grass is this tall Your roots underneath are also the same the same length it mirrors So if you let your grass get taller and taller the root system underneath also gets longer and deeper under the soil But as they graze and they graze and they graze the roots kind of die off at the same level so it mirrors what's above so the better grasses forages in your pasture the better their root systems are which hold water so in times of drought and things um, your pasture is going to be better off than your neighbors that just leave their cows on it and they constantly pick their favorite spots and overgraze and overgraze and overgraze so there's your little um, pasture grass management spiel <laughs> I'm about to go back to the garden because I'm sure there's zucchinis the size of toddlers back there. Cause you know, when you're gone for four days and you come back, your squash is gonna be ginormous. But I really need to work on drinking more water. And a way that I have been doing that is I fill up my water bottle. It's just ice water. And then I've got these beautiful mint plants out here. This one is apple mint. And in the back of this pot, I've got some chocolate mint. And I will just, um, I like to do a little bit of both. The apple mint doesn't taste like apples, spoiler. But it does have um, just like a sweet mint flavor. And I'm going to cut it back. <laughs> I don't wash this. Uh, so I'm just going to make sure there's no, there's some dog hairs. Um, but I'm just going to make sure it has no bugs on it because I would rather not eat bugs. And I'll just tear it to kind of release the flavors inside. And then I'll just put it in my water bottle and wait a few minutes, like 20 minutes or less. And then you have mint infused um, water and that helps me drink more when it's just a little bit of flavor rather than just plain water um, I wish there was smell-o-vision because this chocolate mint is amazing the only thing that would make this better is if I had an infuser so I wouldn't get like um, chunks of mint when I drink it but I don't mind <laughs> And then I have mint water to take with me. Well, I just pulled up here and giant squash, I can already see from this bed. Um, so I'm gonna get busy and harvesting, but I wanted to show you what I was harvesting into. These are actually old produce crates. So people that buy in um, veggies, like a grocery store or 
someone that orders a lot of veggies a lot of times they come in these plastic crates and they're collapsible and these are my favorite things to harvest into and I just wanted to tell you that I've seen a lot on Facebook marketplace someone gifted me these um, but there are some on Facebook marketplace in my area um, so if you wanted some good veggie crates because these are stackable too uh, look on Facebook Marketplace. That's like my favorite place to go for good deals. <laughs> you can also buy them online, but they're much more expensive. They're like $5 a crate online, uh, but you can get them pre-owned, so used for like a dollar a crate, which is a pretty good deal. Like, look at this monstrosity. This is way too big for this variety. Um, oh, the skin's still soft though, so maybe not. But how you can tell is the reason why summer squash is called summer squash is because you eat it in the summertime while the skin is still um, soft and the fruit is small, more palatable that way. Winter squash, you can eat in the summer, um, small and soft when the skin is still soft, or, you can let any squash harden, um, so grow all the way on the plant and the skin will get hard. And how you tell, I just poke my thumbnail in and if it's soft, then it's still good to go. Um, the seeds are just gonna be massive in this, so you kinda have to scoop it out like a melon or something, but still edible. But technically, you could eat any summer squash like a winter squash. So let it ripen all the way on the plant and then pick it and let it cure. And you can store it and use it later. But typically, the varieties that are meant for eating in the winter time, which is winter squash, have a tastier flesh. This is probably going to be bland either way. Um, but it's really delicious fried in butter with some garlic salt. Delicious. One thing that's pretty much inevitable if you grow squash, um, and maybe not if you live in a place where squash bugs don't exist, um, let me know where that is because I'm jealous. <laughs> but here is what squash bug eggs look like. And they will decimate your crop in a matter of what feels like hours, but days. You'll walk out one day and your plant will be all wilty and sad and I can already tell that I have squash bug damage on some of my plants. Now I'm squishing these eggs so that they don't hatch into those little demonic bugs. But what I do to fight this, because there's almost no fighting squash bugs, they will win the battle in my experience, is I do nothing. The squash bugs are inevitable. They're going to come. I'm not using any pesticides of any kind, organic or not, on my stuff. Um, I just, that's how I choose to garden. And so how I combat the squash bugs is I just plant more squash. So right now, today after I'm done harvesting, I'm going to go sow more seeds. And today is mid-July. And I still have plenty of time because it's a 55 day to harvest usually on squash. I still have plenty of time to sow squash before my last frost or my first frost, which is mid-October. Now you have to think, um, so you count back your days from your usual first frost date to now, and that'll give you a set amount of days. And that's how you know how many days you have left in your season for summer things. Um, but I always add on probably 10 days to that if I'm planting later in the season because that sunshine by September is not the same sunshine as July, which means things grow a little slower. So I like to add on a few days just so I know that I for sure have time. So if it's 55 days for a squash, in my brain I just say 65. Um, but I still have time for squash and I'm gonna plant more because I want to have it most of the season. Squash will lay, or squash bugs will lay their eggs. As you can see on a flower, I've never noticed them on flowers before though. On stems, evil. 
and on the back of your leaves. So if you have a small garden and you just have a couple um, plants, you can easily hand pick the eggs off because as you can see against the green, they're super easy to see. And if you stay on top of it and you consistently pick the eggs off, um, your squash bugs aren't ever gonna hatch. So you'll have a couple uh, that you can pick off, but that's one way that you can fight it. I just have like a hundred plants and there's no way that I can hand pick all those bugs off. So, okay, here's what happens to squash. Ideal picking size. This is virtually no seeds have started to form in here. The whole thing is delicious. It's tender. Okay, you get a little bit bigger. This is where the seeds are in this variety. Um, so, still edible, still good, still soft. Um, you're just going to find more seeds in this part. This, you could beat somebody with. Um, yeah, this is going to just stay at my house. I'm not going to give my CSA members this giant squash because um, it's probably full of seeds. Now I will say that it's still soft, but you could grate this and make zucchini muffins, brownies. I've seen people dehydrate zucchini. This is what I wanna do this year, is dehydrate zucchini, grind it into a powder and substitute it like half of your flour in a recipe and you can use zucchini flour, which would be like lower carb um, if that's something that you are tracking but I just thought it was fun. <laughs> now this This is what happens when you leave your zucchini for four days. It turns in to human baby size squash. I don't know how I'm honestly gonna get this out of here, but I got another squash row to pick. So let's pick that one now. Oh my gosh, first of all, I'm out of breath because I just ran. Second of all, I've got to take a break from harvesting because there's been a development. I was just counting heads and I'm like, I only see three cows. We have four. Oh my gosh. But both girls, Candy and Peanut, were bred around the same time. I think Peanut was bred first, possibly. But I was just thinking like, oh no, what if something happened to her? And I come down here at the end of the barn lot and I look in this little hut. We're almost there. It's not about you. I look in this little hut and Peanut is in there with a baby. Hey. Yes. I was just out in the garden picking stuff and then I was thinking I only see three cows. So I walked down here to the hut and Peanut's yeah. in there with her calf. I knew it. I sent you a text message. Did you get it? Yeah. Is it pretty? It's probably gorgeous. I don't it? know. She, it, she won't come out of the hut, but it's nursing. Okay. So, chalk this up to another birth on the farm that I missed because I just missed Honey's birth by a few minutes and I just missed Peanuts by a few minutes because I can tell it's still kind of wet. Um, it's, he's got his little baby legs. I don't know if it's a girl or a boy. I'm gonna wait on my husband to get home just because she is a beef cow. Oh yeah, and she's still got drainage. She just had that calf, but I am glad that everything looks fine. The calf looks super healthy. She looks healthy and she's letting it nurse. She's licking it. This is her first calf. She is a first time, or a first calf heifer. Um, technically a cow now. 
<laughs> my little baby's all grown up but she is our only beef that we are keeping for um to produce more beef <sighs> i can breathe easy now how am i supposed to go back to garden work when there's a baby calf out there i just want to snuggle him but i have a feeling peanut's gonna be a little cray cray um so it's not really safe for me to get in there when there's no one else here so as much as i want to i'm going to abstain from getting mauled by a protective mama cow okay back to harvesting squash which now seems pretty boring since there's a little baby out there but i do have an exciting addition i've never grown this variety of squash before isn't this fun this is a summer squash variety i got from baker creek and i don't remember what it is but i will put it down here um, when i'm editing because i'll look it up then but isn't this fun i mean life is too short to just grow black beauty zucchini to just grow red tomatoes to just grow green beans variety of the spice of life you all and um, the more that you can stay excited about the garden and the more you can stay ex like in anticipation of what's growing because you just need to see it and taste it and eat it um, that's what keeps you going when it's July mid-July the bugs are out uh, things are weedy it's hot it's muggy it's sticky there's no rain um the things that keep you in your garden is like what you're excited for so grow exciting things this might be the most fun squash i've grown so far this year and it's got like some pretty striping on that isn't this cute i can just sit it on my table Here's another fun, one of my favorites is a scalloped squash. So I think I have a green variety, Bennington's green tint or something along those lines farther down and I'll show you in a second. But these are some of my favorites. You know how zucchini and like regular squash doesn't have much flavor. Um, it's just kind of the spongy thing that you season and you eat. These are a little, have a little bit more flavor if you notice me winking my eyes are very sensitive which is why i always have sunglasses on in my video but i thought i was going to be safe because it's so hazy the sun is not really out but it's going directly into my eyes right now um so so sorry for the squinting but i just can't see summer squat or er, scalloped squash is one of my favorites because it has a little bit of a different flavor it's a little like nuttier um so it just gives it a little more flavor this is probably too big um although the skin is a little bit still soft but these i feel like toughen up a lot faster than a zucchini does um so you just have to stay on top of picking like these two are the ideal size this one a little too big it will have seeds all in the center of this but you can still eat it i usually just cut the seedy part out and eat the edges again another example of what happens when you leave during zucchini season is you get giant zucchinis but i've been thinking this whole time how am i going to give these to my csa members because they're not the tender delicious little fruits they're massive and so they get a little tougher i think i'm going to send these out anyway i'm a perfectionist when it comes to my product so it's painful for it to not be just right but I'm learning to have a little more give um, because it's just life. I'm going to send these out still in my CSA, but I think I'm gonna include some like zucchini recipes. Like um, I saw this good recipe for like chocolate zucchini muffins that sounds delicious, the classic zucchini bread, things that they can make um, with these massive zucchinis that they normally wouldn't think of. And I think that'll still be fun. Okay, here's zucchini haul number two. Um, I'm gonna have a lot of squash. I'm gonna walk around and see what else is ready because I know that the garden is exploding right now and there's tons of stuff. My hot pepper row, I'm seeing lots of fruits. This one, sugar rush peach. The fruit is 
up to size. Now it's just gonna change a little color. You can eat peppers at any stage, which means you can eat them while they're small and green, or you can wait on them to ripen and turn a color. Um, my preference is I like to wait until the flavor is developed. Hot peppers, it doesn't matter as much. And honestly, the pepper's a little bit more mild when it's not so grown. What is this? I'm growing a couple hot peppers that I've never grown before. I got them in a swap. I think this is one of them. Look how crazy this fruit looks. It just looks spicy, you know? Look at that. And if I'm guessing right, that's called the Sharpay pepper. And now you see how it gets its name because it's all crinkly like a Sharpay dog. Um, I'm a little sissy when it comes to heat, so I probably won't be eating a whole lot of those, but I do like to make a fermented hot sauce. Um, and I'm not gonna have any lack of hot peppers this year. This one is called Bolivian Rainbow. First of all, it's beautiful. The foliage is this dark purple with the green center. That alone is pretty. And then you look at the fruits on it. First of all, they point upright, which makes them cute. Second of all, they're purple. <laughs> oh my gosh, I need sunglasses, you guys. I cannot see. I am crazy about shishitos, and shishitos are one of the most productive peppers I've personally ever grown. And I have at least 50 plants here, so I'm going to be covered up in shishitos all summer. But another reason why I planted so many was because, oh, there's so many ready. But I wanted to have enough to share with my CSA members because I think everyone should eat them. Everyone should experience the magic of a blistered shishito dipped in what my husband likes to call yum yum sauce. Um, it's just, there's nothing like it. But I'm gonna wait to pick those until he's home because it's gonna take forever and he can help me. This feels really good. If you look behind me and ignore these weeds in the center, see how beautiful my peppers are looking? When I planted these, you guys, they were so sad. <laughs> They were so sad and then the heat wave came and they were even more sad. So the fact that I'm looking out and I'm seeing fruit and I'm seeing bushy plants and I'm seeing healthy <sighs> makes me breathe a sigh of relief because I was really worried there for a minute, you guys. <laughs> but I don't think I'm gonna have anything to worry about. I think I'm gonna have more peppers than I know what to do with here pretty soon. And that's exciting. I mentioned this in a video that I shot a week or two ago but you see this short little sad pepper plant right here? I think I have volunteer ground cherries coming up everywhere, by the way. Um, if this is what this is, it's either a volunteer ground cherry or a tomatillo. But anyway, you see this sad pepper. First of all, you see this, pull the weeds out. And there's a couple in a row, these shorty little pepper plants that's growing a pepper. I will always snip those off. This pepper plant is not big enough to sustain this fruit. And so it's gonna spend all of its energy trying to grow and ripen this fruit so that it continue its life cycle. Every plant's goal is to produce seed of some kind so that they can live on in further generations. But um, I want that pepper plant to focus on growing because obviously she got a little stunted. She's a little behind uh, her other friends and that's okay. There's still plenty of time in this season to grow, but I'm gonna help her along by taking off this fruit so she can focus energy on putting down a root system and growing bigger to make more fruit in the long run. Um, for me, since I have so many, this isn't painful to take off a couple fruit off a little plant. But if you're at home and you've only got a handful of pepper plants, I feel for you. It is hard to pull them off, but you'll be better for it in the long run because your plant will produce more overall if it has the energy to do so. Okay, I'm back. I let my camera charge up a little bit. I got a pair of sunglasses, so 
my eyes can see and I can already see tons of cucumbers in this patch and I of course forgot my snips when I came back out so I'm just gonna have to use my little thumbnail and pluck all these off this first um, cucumber on my trellis is my Armenian I think it's the Armenian white but the Armenian cucumber which is actually a melon um, comes in a striped variety and a really light green that they call white variety and we'll only know when I uh, see the fruits on it. it still doesn't have any fruit on it I don't think I'm trying to wait patiently but I'm not being very patient this silver slicer produces so many cucumbers and it produces and it produces and it produces and sometimes in the heat cucumbers tend to get better bitter and I haven't found um, to have a super uh, big problem with bitterness in these silver slicers I really really like it um, there are a million fruits on these plants let's do a time lapse and see how many cucumbers I can pick off of just this handful of cucumbers This is already really heavy. Um, but this is 62. 62 um, silver slicer cucumbers off of one, two, probably 10 plants. Um, I planted more than I thought I did. So 10 or less plants will go gracious. And I picked everything I possibly could uh, five days ago and I have 62 cucumbers silver slicers they are out competing everything else except for the other just normal cucumber called straight eight it's also beating everybody else but those are my two favorites of the season thus far I will be planting another flush of these so that I can make sure that I have some because cucumbers like squash usually succumb to something um, the squash bugs like them, but also the cucumber beetles um, will destroy them or some kind of pest usually gets them. Everything looks really good so far, fingers crossed. But these are another 55 day to harvest uh, crop. So if you didn't plant any, you didn't plant enough and you want to plant more, um, cucumbers, super easy and delicious. And we love pickles. That's why I planted all of these. Well, that and I have to feed... Uh, my members of the CSA but after that I'm going to pickle them all and put them in my pantry because we, we, get, we could go through at least two jars of pickles a day if we're all eating them because we all think that they're delicious so lots of pickles in my future but now I'm gonna set a time lapse for the rest of the rows this is insane <laughs> as you can see cucumber time is happening so we've got this whole tub and some of this and to think I was worried if I was gonna have enough to share but also make pickles I don't think I'm gonna have a problem with that especially because as an insurance to my pickle fund I'm going to plant more today tonight um, but I wanted to show you silver slicers little sister this is called salt and pepper a good example of salt and pepper is this this is a mature ready to pick um, mini Whoop. they call this a pickling cucumber because it stays small and crunchy this is what happens when they get away from you and get overripe this is probably bitter um, but possibly they might stand a chance just because they're from the silver slicer gene and 
um, silver slicers don't tend to get very bitter. So fingers crossed, it's still edible, but I wouldn't make a pickle out of this. The gel and seeds inside are gonna be fully formed. Um, what I am gonna do though, is this ripe, ripest one, I might try to save seeds from. Mm, possibly. I am going to get busy picking tomatoes. I'm gonna start with the slicers, possibly, and end with the cherries. Now here's a little word about what you're about to see, because I'm not proud of it. <laughs> You know like when someone comes over to your house unannounced and you have to say, excuse the mess, I live here, um, just because you're a little bit on the messy side and everything is always chaotic. Um, this is how my tomatoes are looking this year because I've been gone uh, for a few days and everything needs tied up. So everything looks really sad, but I will get it back. While I'm over here, Let's have a word about garden pests. <sighs> the one that's almost the most annoying is the tomato hornworm. And what you are going to see when you know that you have tomato hornworm damage is tomato plants that look like sticks. I don't know if you can see, but it's really defoliated. It looks abnormal. You come out and you're like, there's a normal leaf and here's a stick what happened and also fruit that looks like this telltale signs of a tomato hornworm now you can pick them off and i usually do when i can find them the problem is they're the same color as a tomato plant and when you've got a tomato jungle, like I do, it's the perfect place for them to hide. They will usually be on a, on a branch or on the underside of a leaf, if that helps. You can also get a black light flashlight and come out here at nighttime because they glow. And so they're much easier to see. I'm going to have to try to find mine. I know once upon a time, I did have that special flashlight, but I have children who love special flashlights. So I don't know if I know where it is as of right now, but it's gonna be on the list of things to look for because I can see at least right now, 10 plants that have hornworm damage and that where there's one, there's a million. I'm going to start at the back of the tomato jungle and work my way forward so that I don't have to carry the box as far. Let's begin. So some parts are gonna be sped up and then I will stop it when I need to talk about a variety because I have so many and this would be a 14 hour long video if I talk all the way through this. So I'm gonna refrain. I will start by showing you how I label my tomatoes because I feel like that's very important to know what varieties you have. And it's taken me a few years to figure out, but um, I finally found a system I like. So if you can look down here, um, I ordered these rat lace plant tags that go around the base of a plant. And I wrote the variety name with a Hello. I wrote the variety name with a garden marker that doesn't fade. So it's fade resistant and the tag goes around the stem so I cannot possibly misplace a tag. Fingers crossed. Because when you save seeds, you it's really important that you know what variety it is you're saving. The first variety that I'm picking today is called Pink Berkeley Tie-Dye. It has this really pretty pink and green striping to it. It's one of my favorites because you cut it open and it's like mostly green with like a red dot in the center. And I like tomatoes that are full of gel. I know some people don't, but I love those. And this one is a juicy. I like a juicy. You know what's depressing? This stick. This hornworm damage that got three of these fruits. So I just cut the whole branch off because what's the point? I don't want the plant to spend time trying to ripen the fruit that's already chewed on. So you gotta cut your losses. 
This is a pretty tasty dark tomato called black semen. Um, it's not all the way 100% ripe, but if it's blushing out here, I'm picking it because we are supposed to get some rain tonight. And when you have a tomato that's ripening and you get a bunch of rain at once, your fruit will split and bugs will get in. So I'm just going to pick everything that's even close to being ripe. This, the queen, black beauty. Um, you know when it's ripe, first of all, when you squeeze it and it's got some give, it's a little soft. But the bottom, you can see, is just blushing. Um, this is actually a red tomato with a lot of anthos anthocyanin, which makes it purple. Um, so the bottom will be red when it's fully ripe. I'm very pleased to see that a lot of these plants out here have some bit, pretty big fruit. This is one I picked probably pretty early, but like I said, I don't want them to split. That one's called persimmon. It's a large orange one. And then this is one of my favorites. Um, that's kind of wonky, but this is Thornburn's terracotta. I don't know if it comes off on camera, but it's a super pretty like burnt orange color. Like this is fully ripe. You can see that it was a cat face tomato, which is just means like two blossoms were fused together and it's super ripe. Should I just eat it out here? It's so good. And it's like warm from the heat of the sun. But it's got a kind of like burnt orange slash green center. It's really beautiful. And delicious. And you know what? I'm going to sit in the shade a second and actually enjoy this tomato. Because I wait on this season all year. I cry about it in the winter time. Like I have the winter blues every year and I yearn for the garden. I'm dreaming about it, planning it, thinking about it. And then rarely do I take the time to actually sit and enjoy it because it is so much work, especially when you're preserving it. Um, it does get, you get a little burnout, and I just don't want to be burnout. So I'm going to sit here and finish this tomato, enjoy a nice little breeze in the shade. Okay, I'm back from my little snacky. Um, this is a variety called Homestead that I, it's new to me this year. I didn't know that the fruits were going to be so small. Um... One thing about me is that if I have a tomato that th that's this size, like more of a saladette size, it's got to be really special because I hate this size. And the plant is loaded with fruit, but they're all small, so... Oh my goodness. You guys. You see this? Now this is a tomato. Look how massive this is. Look how big this is, you guys. This is a huge tomato and this variety is new to me too and this is much more pleasing than the other variety. This is a variety I got from Baker Creek called Bread and Salt. And it's got massive fruits. Let me go see if there's any more. Okay, look, this is an abnormal shape, kind of like an ox heart shape, um, but it's kind of skinnier, but long. I don't know. I've never grown any that look like this, but this is fun. Okay, here's another one that was just blushing, um, but I'm going to pick it because when you're in the sale, the selling of tomatoes, you've got to just get what you can get. This one's blushing. And this one, just a tinge of blushing, but they will finish ripening on the table or inside because um, once you see a tomato has started to blush, even just the tiniest bit, this plant has already started to release an enzyme or a hormone, I can't remember which one, I'll put the word at the bottom, <laughs> that will tell the tomato to keep ripening as long as it has started blushing. 
Now one like this that I accidentally cut because it was connected to the one I meant to cut and I didn't know it. This might turn a color on the table if I left it long enough, but it's not going to have the same flavor or texture or anything. This is better used as like a green tomato. Um, so do what, what you will. There will be casualties, okay? But let me keep harvesting because I just saw another big one. This is another new fruit to me this year called Granny Cantrells. And ain't she pretty? This is a nice big tomato. I mean, this is what you think of when you think red slicer, right? Beautiful. Okay, you guys, I'm running out of camera battery for the second time today, which means I have, this video is gonna be so long. So only the real fans of gardening are gonna hang around till this. <laughs> But I am about to go harvest cherry tomatoes and I will bring them back and I'll show you how much I um, harvested and I'll tell you a little bit about a couple of the varieties. But I can't film it because I'm going to run out of battery. Um, and I just, I have another job to do. I owe these people a CSA box and I've got to harvest. No distractions. Um, but I am wearing... My Rue apron, I find this is the best way to harvest um, lots of things if you have a smaller garden because you can fit it all in here and then transfer it. Um, but for me, I like to pick cherry tomatoes into here so I can just keep picking because I can just put them into my pocket, this little Joey pocket, and just keep going. So next time you see me, I'll have a bunch of cherries. I am running out of orifices to put... Orifices. No, that's opening. I'm running out of things to put the things in because I'm harvesting so much. But I've literally gone down three quarters of two rows. So together, maybe a row and a half. And I've got quite a bit. I'm afraid I'm going to squish it, so I'm going to empty it. And the cool thing about this is that you can just dump them out. Now a couple little fun facts about what I've harvested because it's all sun gold and a new variety to me this year called Lucky Tiger that I got the seeds from MI Gardener and it's green but it has slight red orangish striping on it. It's actually super delicious. It's really sweet but the dilemma I have is these oblong types of cherries are way more prone to split in the past i've grown this variety that's delicious but I, it was so splitty that i had to kick it out called blush um where like every single fruit on the plant split like this now these only like one in five or ten have split so it's okay what i do it would be disappointing if this was your only cherry tomato and a lot of them split but what i do is i just eat these in the garden and then take in the ones that are perfect so no harm no foul to me but if this had any more splitting than it did i'm not sure that i would continue to grow it because there's a whole world of cherry tomatoes out there and if you don't like one pitch it and find a new one <laughs> okay I've been down another row and this is insane, you guys. Like overflowing. Uh oh. Truly overflowing. And I still have. The problem here is that I've been down. Three rows, I think. Three. Of which I have eight, I think. I should really know these things. And, for one, I'm running out of room. For two, it's thundering. Which is a no bueno. But I need to get these picked before it rains on them because extra rain makes them split. So, I'm gonna make this fast. One of my favorite tomatoes black cherry this is one of my first cherry tomatoes i really fell in love with the flavor is super good 
It's like a dark tomato, but sweet. Um, really good. Also, Sun Gold, classic. I planted a bajillion of those. This is a new variety to me this year called Chocolate Cherry. Isn't it beautiful? Or no, chocolate, chocolate pear. Yeah, it's chocolate pear. It's a new variety to me. This year, as you can see, it splits. But it healed over nicely and there's nothing in there. So let me tell you what it tastes like. It's actually super mild. It's good. Um, but there's no like punch of flavor that you usually get in a cherry tomato. It's okay. Okay, I gotta go back and finish harvesting. Okay, I have two rows left, which is seven rows, not eight. The thunder is getting closer, but I'm not a quitter. And so I have to finish picking. I have to, before the rain. I have to hurry. First up, Isis candy. One of my faves. Um, it, at first glance, kind of looks like a sun gold, but you flip it over and it's got this mottled red on the underneath side. Super sweet, super delicious. This variety. Berry, no. It's bred by Brad's Atomic Grape. Or, it's bred by Brad Gates that made Brad's Atomic Grape. I guess I'll talk about it because I'm already holding it. <laughs> I was just trying to find one more ripe, but I don't have time. The rain is coming. <sighs> okay, this is what she looks like. Um, the more ripe it gets, the more red it will get and the less green. You can kind of see it on this side. Delicious. Some people think this tastes weird, but I think it's really good. This, blue cranberries. I knew it would come to me. It's okay. It is not my favorite. It's not even in my top five. The only reason I grow this is because you guys know that I like a colorful tomato basket. And it has purple shoulders, first of all. Second of all, when the stem comes off, you know, the stem on a tomato like this, when it comes off of this one, it makes a cute little star. This is the only reason I grow this. There is another one that's red. I don't like it. Um, so I grow this to have a star and still somewhat enjoy what I'm eating. Oh my gosh, the rain is coming. But I'm just going to get rained on because I only have two rows left and I'm going to finish my job. Okay, this is what you call mess around and find out because I thought I could beat the rain and I'm not beating it and my camera died so this is my phone so I'm sorry if the audio is not the same. But now I'm stuck under my cute gazebo because I can't go out there with my camera but I can't leave my camera here and no one's home to save me. Do you hear that? Let's just take a listen, shall we? It's magical. And I want to, and I don't care to be the old person in a young person's body and just watch the rain and say, we needed this. We did. Um, but let's talk about a couple varieties. I don't even know if you can hear me or not. Because I've got a couple more. Berry's Crazy Cherry. It's like this yellow. Look at my hands. This yellow cherry tomato. It's pretty sweet. It's delicious. If you're growing in a small space, I recommend that because it makes a ton. Hence the name Berry's Crazy Cherry. Here's one called, I'm growing two that are super similar. This is Sunrise Bumblebee. Um, but there's another one in a different bucket that looks almost exactly the same called Tropical Sunset. And their flavor is pretty close. These little red ones are Matt's Wild Cherry. Um, 
what else so we got this is called white currant this is probably overripe but hmm, pretty good super sweet what else we got in this pocket of mystery here's one in my cherry tomato row that I know I didn't mess up because I got these seeds I bought these seeds and the plant beside it is growing tomatoes <clears throat> that look like the description but this tomato is a mystery but I will still eat it because I am not tomato discriminatory Napa Chardonnay pretty good a little sweet yellow the yellow ones are usually more mild but anyway I think that's enough because by the time I go to edit this video by the time I edit this video it's probably a very long video so all the all the fake fans <laughs> would have left by now. Only the true garden crazy people are here at the end. So if you are, um, thank you guys for watching. This was my harvest slash um, show and tell video. But uh, I will be back next week with another one. So stay tuned. The sun's coming out and it's still raining. But anyway, thank you guys for watching. Until next time.